Let me get around to why we're all here, which is uh, Grover Norquist. Uh, as we always do, we have a bio at your table. I'm not going to belabor the uh, points that are there. He's got a very distinguished uh, career and background in public policy. He's probably one of the more influential people in Washington as we speak. Uh, last night I was, uh, had dinner with Joey Loudermilk. Joey mentioned that we need more people with character and conviction in government. And that's the two qualities that he looks for most often. Well, I can't vouch for the character always, but I'll say in terms of the conviction or at least the commitment, Grover Norquist has done a lot in the last 10 years to ensure that if they're not con uh, have conviction, they certainly commit to no new taxes <clears throat> or they suffer some dire consequences. And, and just one example I'll mention without embarrassing you, particularly at this point in time, Grover is in the 1988 uh, presidential primary and the Republican presidential primary. Bob Dole made the mistake of not signing Grover Norquist's organization's pledge of no new taxes. Uh, Bob Dole paid the consequences for that in New Hampshire, and this year Bob Dole gladly signed on to Grover Norquist's no new tax increase. So, uh, without further ado, it is a distinct honor for me to introduce to you Grover Norquist. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I'm delighted to be joining uh, with you as we move into an era where a lot more responsibility <clears throat> and resources are going to move from Washington to the state level. It's particularly important uh, that groups like the Georgia Public Policy Foundation uh, continue and grow in strength and uh, state taxpayer groups and, and state institutions that can think about how to solve problems at the state level. One of the challenges we had from the left and, and I remember this uh, directly on a television show immediately after the Republicans won 94. And this person said, you'll never send power and authority out to the states now that, uh, now that you've taken Washington. It's not natural. You leave power and authority where you sit. Uh, and I said, I, th I think that uh, because of groups like the Georgia Public Policy Foundation, and, and there are 38 organized now, roughly, um, states that have uh, uh, similar uh, state foundations that are, that are taking a leadership role, um, and we, sh we need to be in all 50, but we are much better prepared today than, say, 10 or 20 years ago, uh, free marketeers, conservatives, taxpayer activists would have been uh, in terms of moving decisions to the state level. I'd like to talk about what happened in 1994 and why that has changed the direction of history and sort of what the state of play is, because we're in a lull right now. We're in the eye of a storm, and a lot of people get frustrated. They go, gee, nothing's happening. And I'd like to make the case that a lot of things are happening, most of them uh, good for, for our team uh, and, and bad for the left. In 1994, the following happened. November 8, 1994, five years to the day from when the Berlin Wall first came down, the Republican Party took the House and the Senate. They took the House for the first time in 40 years. We picked up a net increase for the Republican Party of 52 House members and then eight senators. Now, we added to that now five party switchers in the House and two party switchers, uh, Senator Shelby uh, from next door and, and Ben Nighthorse Campbell from Colorado, uh, two switchers in the Senate. But, and that's what the press has tend to focus on. Take the House and the Senate, the press, national press, lives in Washington, D.C. They saw that. They noticed uh, that that was going on, and they wrote about that as the story. But I think they missed a larger story, and that is at the same time that the Republicans picked up 52 House members, eight Senate members, they picked up 11 governorships and came very close in Georgia uh, and Maryland. And uh, what happened was in addition to 11 governors, so there are now 31 Republican governors, the Republicans picked up 480 state legislative offices uh, so that they're now a majority of state legislatures, houses, and senates controlled by the Republicans. Prior to 1994, and this gets into the question about whether the Republicans are really going to devolve power to the states. Prior to 1994, there were 17 states where the Democratic Party controlled both houses of the state legislature and the governorship. So if they want to change labor law, they could do that. If they want to change 
uh, tort law, they could do that. If they wanted to uh, change election law, uh, they could change the rules, campaign finances, whatever the Democratic Party wanted to change, they had the votes in the House, Senate, and the governor to sign it in 17 states. Georgia was one of them. The Republicans controlled all of three states. Anybody remember what they were? Arizona, Utah, and New Jersey because of the um, Whitman defeat of Florio because of his tax increase. Now, New Jersey is a fine state. Utah is a fine state. Arizona is a fine state. They're not necessarily, with the exception of New Jersey, large states. Today, after the 94 election, uh, and 50 party switchers at the state legislative level, um, uh, from Democrat to Republican, there are now 15 states that where the Republican Party has the governorship in both houses. And there are only seven where the Democratic Party has the governorship in both houses. And we're in one of those seven uh, here. Uh, the other states that the Democratic Party still controls, in addition to Georgia, is Hawaii and the rim of the Confederacy. Arkansas, Missouri, can, they're all attached to each other. Arkansas, Missouri, Kentucky, West Virginia, which isn't really a state, and, <laughs> and Maryland, Maryland, which they had to steal the election uh, to keep the governorship there in this, in this last election. So again, not large states and not trendsetters, and every one of them trending Republican um, in, in recent history, I think, in the future. The 15 states that the Republicans control include New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Illinois, and then all the square states in the West. Um, but those, you know, the ones that are easy to draw, um, those are large states. But one question is, would Speaker Gingrich and, and uh, Leader Bob Dole really have cheerfully sent, you know, $20 billion over the next seven years to Mario Cuomo's New York? to hire Democratic precinct workers to beat their heads in. No matter how much you believed in federalism, that would be a tough call. That really would. Would you really send um, to, to, to Texas, run by a lady Democrat, you know, $15 billion over the next seven years to spend on welfare? My guess is they'd spend the money in the first two years and then say to the Republicans, well, your program didn't work. Send more money. Um, but because of the, the control that Republicans and conservatives have at the state level, it is now possible and feasible, and, and in the budget that, that Clinton vetoed, uh, the Republicans in the House and Senate did, they sent real resources, real responsibility, real autonomy uh, to the state level. And if Vermont, with their Democratic uh, Governor Dean, wanted to mess it up, they could, but you, then it would be Vermont's fault and Dean's fault, not the fault of the concept of federalism, because next door to them uh, would be New York and New Hampshire and, and Pennsylvania and states uh, with, re with Republican governors and or legislatures that would not have gone into, uh, made those mistakes. So this shift of power uh, was significant because now, of course, there are 15 states where the Republicans can pass election law changes, labor law changes, uh, tort law changes, uh, any number of shifts, all of which weaken the Democratic coalition. But add to the simple list of House members, Senate members, and Washington State legislators, patronage. The Democratic Party has lived on patronage in this country. When we picked up 52 House seats for the Republicans in the House, each one of them has 22 job slots. A thousand Democrat staffers lost their jobs in Washington on the House Representative side on November 8th. 1,000. 2,000 lost their jobs on the committees on the House side another 2,000 on the Senate side. So that's about 5,000 in Washington alone. Go out to the states. Governor of uh, Wyoming appoints 700 people. Now, Wyoming is not a large state. It's one of the square states, but it's not a large state. And seven full, 700 full-time political appointments is a huge shift in resources. Uh, governor of New Mexico, 1,500 jobs appointed. All across the country, given the governor changes, the, the state legislative changes, uh, the Democratic Party lost somewhere between 50 and 70,000 patronage jobs. That is several small towns full of James Carvilles uh, working for the other team. So when you hear about the labor unions bragging they're going to spend 25 
$35 million to feed Republicans, we should take that seriously. And it's very serious. But they have got an awful lot of making up to do, given their loss of, of, of resources um, in, in, in terms of uh, patronage around the country. Let me suggest that the best way to think of the new Republican conservative majority in this country, and I would argue that it is a natural governing majority, that we have seen it emerge at the presidential level from 1968 on. Now let's remember what the, how well the liberal Democratic identified liberal candidate for president has done since 68. 1968, Hubert Humphrey got 42% of the vote. 1972, George McGovern got all of 38% of the vote. 1976, as Speaker Gingrich points out, uh, we didn't run a, a conservative and they didn't run a liberal. We ran the guy who wanted to give away the Panama Canal Treaty, thought Poland was independent, and was Ronald Reagan's challenger against their guy who was the Southern uh, fellow with a military background, the anti-Washington Southern Baptist, um, who was running against Washington, and Carter won. Four years later, when Carter had governed as a liberal, and the country said, oh, he's a liberal, he got 41% of the vote. When, he, uh, then, when the Democrats then nominated his uh, vice president, uh, Walter Mondale, who announced he thought the country should have higher taxes and that he would raise taxes, uh, he got 41% of the vote. Uh, Mike Dukakis lasted until October before he admitted he was a liberal, and he got 46% of the vote, high watermark of Democratic presidential candidates since 1964. And then back to 43% for Bill Clinton when he won a mandate. He got 3% less than Mike Dukakis when Mike Dukakis embarrassed himself uh, with his loss. <clears throat> what the, the contract with America did, and what Speaker Gingrich had been arguing for doing for 10 years, was to take that natural governing majority at the presidential level when people are crystal clear about who stands for what on the key issues, and push it down into the House and Senate, and beyond that into governors and state legislatures. So we run as our team against their team. And we, we now have a natural governing majority uh, that I refer to as the Leave Us Alone Coalition. And I would suggest, think of who's in the Republican or conservative coalition. Taxpayers who just don't want their taxes increased. Property owners who don't want the fact that it rained last week to declare their farm or their land a wetland and therefore Washington bureaucrats now have some say in um, how your land should be used. Um, gun owners who simply don't want their guns taken away. They don't insist. <clears throat> that everybody else own a gun. They don't insist that we have National Gun Heritage Month. Um, they don't insist that everybody uh, agree that gun owners are swell people and it's an alternative lifestyle that should be encouraged. They, they simply say, look, leave me alone. Get out of my face. Don't steal my gun. We'll get along fine. And in addition, homeschoolers. Also, they don't insist that everybody else homeschool. They don't insist that you recognize that homeschoolers are wonderful. Uh, they just want to be left alone to homeschool. People who send their children to private school are just opting out of state-controlled education. They said, just leave us alone. Small businessmen and women, not looking for subsidies, grants, benefits, just don't tax and regulate us um, out of existence. Now, the, the fault line that the Democrats believe and the establishment press believes exists within this coalition is between so-called economic conservatives and the pro-family movement or social conservatives. And they argue that, that the pro-family conservatives do not fall comfortably into a Leave Us Alone coalition. And I would disagree for three reasons. First of all, the Democrats have been hitting on this, thinking it's like a diamond. If they could just hit the angle right, they'd shatter the coalition. Well, they've been working at it for 10 years, and the year they worked most diligently uh, and loudly at it was 1994. Uh, and they got their heads handed to them. So experience tells us that they haven't been able to make that division stick. Uh, but even theoretically, or understanding agendas, it hasn't worked. Because think back to when the uh, religious right organized politically. It was not after uh, prayer was banned from school in 63. It was not even after Roe v. Wade. It came in the late 70s when Jimmy Carter's um, FCC, Federal Communications folks, decided to go after Christian radio stations, and the IRS, to, to make the teachers' unions happy, started going after Christian schools. And people organized in self-defense against government encroachments on Christian radio stations and Christian schools. And that's when you saw a number of organizations, Moral Majority and others, start to get organized politically. Uh, groups that had been, in the past not been organized politically. Some of those were successful and have grown. Some of them have 
faltered because they were, they were startups. Uh, other groups have come up, such as the Christian Coalition, um, that has been extremely competent nationally and as well as here in, in Georgia. Um, but when you, when you look at sort of why they got organized, it was in a response to government intrusion uh, in their lives. And I believe if you look at the, the, the Christian coalition's political agenda or the um, traditional family values political agenda, it can best be understood operationally as a parents' rights movement. What do they want? I've sat in the room when Speaker Gingrich turns to Ralph Reed and says, so, okay, Ralph, what do you want? That's well, a $500 tax credit per child so parents can raise their own children. He wants schools not to be throwing condoms at kids in uh, class without parents' permission. He doesn't want psychological testing of kids without parents' knowledge or permission. Uh, and he wants the government to basically uh, stop making fun of people of faith uh, and spending taxpayer dollars to do things like piss Christ. Um, that wonderful piece of artwork with a crucifix and a jar of urine that we help pay for um, through our taxes. And it is a, a, a list of things where the government should get out of family life and get out of interfering with families. And the coalition works together very well. And I have a meeting every Wednesday in uh, our offices. We have a large conference room. We have 70 people there. And we have representatives of all the coalition groups, gun owners, taxpayers, uh, property rights people, small businessmen, the Christian coalition, uh, pro-family groups, uh, an Orthodox Jewish conservative group, and everybody is in the room <coughs> can work together because as long as the gun owners promise not to throw condoms at the Christians, and the Christians agree not to steal anybody else's guns, <laughs> and the taxpayers agree not to steal anybody's property, and the small businessmen agree not to raise anybody else's taxes, and everybody agrees not to mess with anybody else in the room, we can all leave happy and go fight the left. This is a low-maintenance coalition. <laughs> Com compare that, compare that, and there'll always be differences of agreement. Again, Speaker Gingrich's observation is, in a majority party, in a majority movement, in a country of 260 million people, you will never eliminate conflict. You manage conflict. If you want to be in a party that eliminates conflict, you're in one of those British Trotskyite parties with seven members that used to have eight, but the guy who misunderstood the Hungarian revolt in 56 was thrown out, and now all seven agree on everything. Um, and that's not <coughs> what a majority party does. But again, those conflicts that do exist and will continue for the next 100 years to exist are manageable, and particularly when seen within the context of the Leave Us Alone Coalition. Um, what is it when there are conflicts that we can reframe the solution to the problem so that it becomes one of getting the government um, out of people's uh, lives and, and, and out of their family lives. The Democrat coalition, the liberal coalition, is a takings coalition. It is a coalition of individuals and groups who view their, uh, the, their view of the federal government, central government, is that it should take things from other people and give it to them. This is usually money. Um, the union uh, bosses, the government workers unions, uh, uh, government workers in general, the grant recipients of uh, federal funding and state funding, uh, the trial lawyers who want to make sure that all contracts run across their desk uh, for alteration, um, and the big city machines that uh, uh, operate patronage machines out of New York and Chicago and Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, LA and San Francisco, who use federal, state, and local money to hire democratic precinct workers to maintain um, political machines in those cities. Uh, and then you add over the economic self-interest groups, the, uh, the beneficiaries of, of state spending, government spending, the radical utopians who really do want to restructure society. And, and here I mean the radical elements of the following uh, movements, the radical elements of the feminist movement, the radical uh, homosexual movement, the environmentalist movement, the animal rights movement, the people who really do want to use state power to run other people's lives and who are irritated at how bourgeois um, Americans uh, lead their lives doing odd things like wearing leather belts and getting married and whatnot. And they want, <laughs> they want the state to interfere here rather than asking uh, simply for tolerance. And I would suggest, because I know the left sees this exactly the other way, it is not the National Rifle Association that insists that in fourth grade all the kids in school read books entitled Heather Has Two Hunters. Okay. <laughs> That's, that's not our coalition that's trying to impose its view on the world. It is not 
Again, gun owners of America insisting that all high school students learn that Leonardo da Vinci as a young man was a well-known gun owner uh, and hunter. Um, that, is, that is not our coalition, that is their coalition. Um, so you have these two large coalitions. And I would argue that as we look ahead to the next 10 years or so, every part of the Republican and conservative coalition is growing, it's getting bigger. And each part of the Democratic coalition is shrinking. And if we continue to put pressure on the budget, it will shrink more rapidly. Look at what's happened to the Democratic coalition since 1994. Their ability to fundraise is greatly reduced. They can no longer in Washington, although they can here in Georgia, introduce what are known in California as juice bills. These are legislation, this is legislation to say, uh, crush the insurance industry. And then everybody comes in and gives their contributions and then the bill is taken out or neutered. But the, the, it's out there so that everybody can come in and make their contribution uh, not to get crushed this year. Massachusetts, my uh, former governor Dukakis was just here. One year it would be the insurance industry, another year it would be the banking industry. There's this big thing, big piece of legislation that everyone had to have to come in and pay tribute, extortion really, uh, not to get eaten that year, and then they'd move on to the next industry. Um, they can't do that now. Uh, Rostenkowski is, is no longer in Congress, and uh, uh, the Democrats don't run ways and means. They don't run each of those industries, and so the the business community um, is not being extorted with the idea that if you don't make a contribution, we're going to take off one of your pinkies uh, this week and, and we'll, we'll, we'll move from there. That is a phenomenal, phenomenal shift. Um, in addition, think through what it means when a billion dollars is cut out of the federal budget. Um, and that is, a billion dollars is 20,000 individuals receiving $50,000 checks that year, okay? So a full-time equivalent, 20,000, you can hire 20,000 people for a billion dollars, or you can give them grants, or you can give them loans, or you can give them um, some kind of uh, welfare payment or uh, uh, job uh, wage and, and benefits, 20,000. The Republicans are talking about spending 200 billion less seven years from now than Bill Clinton wants to spend. 200 billion is 4 million people either receiving $50,000 from the government or in the Republican future not receiving $50,000 from the government. So as, as the Marxists would tell you, under Bill Clinton's future you'd have 4 million people whose objective class interests, dependent on state power, would make them Democrats. And in the Republican future of less government spending, these four million individuals would be in the private sector and their objective class interests would make them Republicans because <clears throat> they don't want higher taxes and they don't benefit um, from state power. That is a huge demographic shift and when you see Bill Clinton and the Democrats going nuts about what you think of as very small alterations in the rate of spending, they can count, they can go out seven years and see uh, that there'll be fewer Democratic precinct workers than before. 75% of the left in this country is government funded. You ever see when they have the conventions and so on, they point out how many are teachers unions and how many are government employees and how many are government uh, uh, union uh, leaders and so on. But 75% of everything on the left in this country is paid for with our tax dollars. If we begin to reduce the size and scope and spending of government, there will not be in America a left the way there is in Europe. There won't, it, it won't exist. I mean, there'll be a Democratic Party. It's going to have to reestablish itself as, as uh, uh, a party that shares the interests of people who work for a living. But, but it, it can't exist as a left party, as a, as a European party of the left. And I would suggest that as we, um, as you look at that, 1% of the Democratic, the left-wing groups, they did a study of their own direct mail lists. They have an aging problem. 1% of their donors um, are under 30. 40% of their donor base uh, will, will have passed on in the next 10 years. Just in the four years, if, if people who became of voting age between 1930 and 1950, in the North in particular, they tended to be more democratic and because they grew up when the <coughs> government first caused the Great Depression, then extended it, but somehow managed to explain that they fixed it, 
um, and then fought World War II, and people thought of the federal government, the central government, as capable of doing big things um, and, and tended to be more statist in their worldview. That is an age cohort that is now between 66 um, and 86 years old, that runs 60-40 democratic and, 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 and in its thinking, more statist. So every year, the, the, there are just through, it, through, it, um, through demographics, 400,000 fewer Democrats in the country than the year before. So Bill Clinton is starting net with a deficit of 1.6 million Democrats compared to where he was in 1992. So each of these trends, this is a trend that used to cut against Republicans. Remember, Goldwater in 64 carried the over 65 vote. Why? Because people who became 21 uh, in 1921, and therefore were six, 65, um, or 64, 65 in 1964, were Republicans in the North because everybody was a Republican in the North, uh, or disproportionately so, and therefore Goldwater, who was supposed to lose the older vote, actually won it because of the demographics of, of, the, of the senior citizen population uh, in 1965 as being, in the North, more Republican. Um, today, it, it's more Democratic in the North. Um, so all of these trends just suggest that the Democratic coalition is shrinking. <coughs> We've seen the tremendous um, a shift in, in party registration in the southern states. Um, and for the first time, uh, as long as they've been counting, 1994, the Republican Party got a majority of the Catholic vote in a congressional election. Um, because the Catholic vote in the North, just as the, 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 vote, the southern vote, is getting over the fact that when they showed up in Boston, the guy who was mean to them was a Protestant Republican, so they went out and registered Democratic. Um, and a lot of Southern voters are deciding that while the Civil War might not have been terribly pleasant, it was 100 years ago, and uh, somehow the Democrats nationally have switched sides on a lot of the key issues there. Um, and therefore, that, that, the demographics of mom was a Democrat, both in the South, but also for Northern Catholics, for the immigrant uh, vote, that is much less um, of, a, uh, of a reason to continue to vote that way. But these things take an awful long time. I was just out in Hawaii, which is one of the other seven states that the Democrats control, and the Japanese Americans in Hawaii vote Democratic because when people started registering to vote, the guys from the mainland who were supervised the sugar fields <coughs> were Republicans, and therefore they all became Democrats. Now the Japanese Americans are all doctors and professors, and they're still voting like they were migrant farm workers. Um, and this is beginning to shift, but there's this sort of a self-conscious thing. Uh, was it Charlie Barker's comment where his mom, the, the basketball player, his mom says, why are you Republican? They're the party of the rich. And he says, mom, I am the rich. Um, <laughs> it takes a while sometimes for people to, people's sense of themselves to catch up with, with, with where they are. And the good news is that in Hawaii, the guy who would be king of Hawaii if we hadn't sort of ended this monarchy thing when we took over, um, the guy who would be king, the head uh, Hawaiian, is now a Republican activist. Uh, and the Japanese, the younger generation, the Japanese Americans who fought in Vietnam are registering Republicans as opposed to the ones who fought in World War II and came back to register a uh, Democrat from, from Europe. So in each of these shifts for the Democratic Party and for the establishment are, are cutting against the continued strength of a growing welfare state, and uh, each of these trends suggests the Republican Party will be getting stronger. Um, I like to uh, take take questions at this point, um, but just uh, as, as as you think through where we're going, the Democrats had hoped to turn the country into a social democracy. That was what health care was all about. It had nothing to do with health care. It was about taking 10 percent of the GNP and putting it under state control, and Bill Clinton came this close to doing that. And had he done that, um, I, I suggested to uh, a writer for a socialist writer for in these times that my analysis was that he looked at the 43% of the vote he got in 92, realized he had to take it up to 51, and decided that he ought to buy 10% of the vote by locking America into dependency. And um, John Judas said, matter of fact, that was not only his analysis of it, that he talked to a number of the German Social Democrats, members of the German 
uh, Socialist Party in Parliament, and they said they'd met with Clinton. They said, you want to win? Get government-run health care, then there'll never be a successful anti-government party in the country again. Look at Europe. The government controls your kids' education, your kids' health, your health, your parents' health, your parents' retirement, your retirement. You really want to run the anti-government party when the government has that much control over people's lives? They don't have parties like the Republican Party in Europe. They have conservative parties that are conservative because <clears throat> they're all excited about something that happened 300 years ago or um, you know, they, they like the king or something and they think that counts as being conservative, uh, but they don't have radical free market get the government out of our face movements because the government's everywhere and in everybody's uh, pocket. And once you have a social democracy, it's tough, if not impossible, to get back out of that. That's what Clinton was trying, where he was trying to get us to. Uh, I ran into Senator Packwood uh, a month after we stopped government-run health care. I was sitting at a, a table at a dinner with um, a gentleman from a company who invited me and these four very pretty women to sit at his table, and Senator Packwood came over, I presume, to talk to me. Um, <laughs> but any minute, about 20 minutes later when I could get his attention, um, we chatted and I said, Senator, I, I really want to thank you for your leadership in the last month of the health care debate because without your leadership we wouldn't have won, which was true. Um, uh, Senator Coverdell was particularly strong the whole way through and really helped organize the fight against that uh, along with, with, with Senator Graham. But Coverdell was, a, was an incredible hero and, and uh, if, 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 if you don't know it, you ought to. He uh, has been a tremendous delight and wonderful surprise uh, you know, up, in, up in Washington, been a tremendous uh, source of strength for the conservative movement and the free market movement. Uh, but Packwood weighed in and, and helped in the last month and was, was critically important. And I asked him, I said, Senator, when, if I had been in the White House as Bill or Hillary Clinton, I would have come to you and offered a deal. You know, 70% of socialized medicine. You could have been the hero of the day. You could have you know, stopped absolute socialism. You could have made it more market-oriented. A lot of people believed it was inevitable. So, that, you know, a lot, it'd be tough to criticize you for cutting a deal when people thought we were going to lose anyway and you'd be making the bill better than, than Hillary's. But in 10 years, you know, the Democrats would figure they could get back whatever the compromise was. And Packwood said, you know, I thought that they would want to negotiate. They never called. I had seven votes for them. That's how close we came to government-run health care in this country and to becoming a social democracy, because seven Republican senators voting with the Democrats would have stopped a filibuster. The Republicans would have had to have sort of joined and tried to make it better. It would have gone right through the House, because of course the minority in the House has like zero uh, ability to stop anything, as, as Speaker Gingrich keeps pointing out to us as we flatten the Democrats on the House side and then have to fight them on the Senate side. Um, that's how close we came. The Democrats came right up there to turning the country into a social democracy, and it didn't work. They came close. I think, frankly, it'll be the kind of thing like the Battle of Stalingrad or the second day of Gettysburg where people just keep replaying it over and over and say, you know, if we'd woken up earlier uh, on the second day, we, you know, we, we might have made it because the Democrats came very, very close to, um, to winning everything. And then in 94, I think they started on a slippery, slidey slope towards less power, less resources, less uh, ability to control the country. Um, and th they're going to, in their own minds, go back and replay those first two years of the Clinton administration, because had they done a number of things differently, they would have had us. Uh, and, and our victory today, which I think is very strong and very secure, uh, but it's going to take a lot of fighting in the future to, to maintain and build on, um, came at a point of terrible vulnerability um, to, the, to the forces of big government. So I'd love to take uh, questions at this point. Yes? Grover, do you have any advice for Senator Dole over the next four months, specifically if it's in, in his interest to reach an agreement with President Clinton on the budget? The first advice for Dole is the advice sp uh, Speaker Gingrich has, has um, been offering as well, and that is that in 94, the Republicans in the House did well because they ran as a team. They said, elect us, and this is what we'll do. Now, a lot of that spilled over onto the rest of the Republican Party, even though the Senate never signed the contract. People somehow presumed that they were part of the deal. 
uh, and as well as uh, local elected Republicans as well. The Republican Party said, here's where we're going. So I think the most important thing for Dole to do, and I believe this is what he will do, is run with the House and the Senate, not do what Nixon did in 72, which was say, oh, you guys are on your own, I'm running as me, um, and then run his own campaign away from and independent of the rest of the party. Um, but rather, and even what Reagan did in 84, Reagan said it's morning in America, which was a great reason to reelect incumbents. Problem was, <coughs> in the House of Representatives, most of the incumbents were Democrats. So you have to have a theme that both helps you elect Republican presidents, congressmen, senators, and governors and state legislators. Uh, one of the things that hasn't been focused on, but there's a brilliant article coming out on this in Policy Review next quarter, is how the Republicans in the House and Senate have coordinated with the Republican governors and state legislators in all of the legislation they've been drafting. I mean, getting the House and the Senate to talk to each other, I mean, what Coverdale does that shocks the House Republicans is once a week, he comes over on Thursday for a meeting with the Republicans' uh, leadership and, and some of the key outside groups. He walks over to the House side. This is considered revolutionary and daring and absolutely the first couple of times, I can't be a senator, he like walked all the way over to, uh, to the House side to like meet with us. Um, and it's one of the things that I think maybe nobody told Coverdale you weren't allowed to do that. Um, but it's been terribly helpful to have stronger relationships between the House and the Senate. And although the press for a while tried to pick a fight between Gingrich and Dole, um, I mean, Dole carried half the sky when we were doing that budget together. So, I mean, he really has worked well with the House side. And it's, and it's a first for everybody being in the majority together and working out. But add the House and the Senate working together, now they're also working with governors. And now you just gotta add a presidential candidate to that. Um, if he runs as part of a team, our Leave Us Alone coalition, vote for the House, the Senate candidate, the presidential candidate, state legislatures, or if you want them, Bill Clinton and the Democrats, you vote for them, we will win that vote 60-40 uh, nationally. And it'll be a landslide. If Clinton can sucker Dole into going, walking out in the middle of the street with him and having the three networks decide, well, we'll referee this fight. I mean, I already, you already know who's won that fight. You know, <laughs> the three networks will announce, well, wow, Clinton won today. So Dole needs to stay in his corner with his team and we need to staple Clinton to his team because he'll, he's gonna try and run away from the Democratic Party so hard and so f far um, that we need to keep reminding everybody of who and, and what he is. Um, and as to whether, I, I think a budget that, that, that strengthens the Leave Us Alone Coalition, that, that moves us in the direction of keeping our promises, even if you don't get everything today, is helpful. Uh, my guess is that Clinton cannot sign anything worth having because Ralph Nader's on the ballot in California as the leader of the Green Party. And Ralph Nader can, can end the Clinton presidential chances. All he has to do is hold a series of press conferences in California, say, I'm running for president. Bill Clinton has betrayed the left. He's betrayed the environmentalist movement. Uh, he's betrayed trial lawyers. He must be stopped. Vote for me. He'll get 5% of the vote. Last poll I saw had him at 10% anyway. He'll, go down, he'll pick up 5% of the vote. Clinton therefore can't carry California. Because if you take the 5% of the hard left in California away, um, it, the Republican would win the, the state. And therefore, Bill Clinton cannot and will not do anything reasonable until now to November. He just can't because the left will get them. Yeah. How about the uh, problems the Republicans face with the uh, specifically, I guess, Pat Buchanan going to Ross Perot? Two things on Ross Perot. I don't think Ross Perot runs again. I've talked to some folks who've, who've spoken with him. He's been out recruiting um, Powell and others to run on his, you know, and, and tr talking to uh, Sam Nunn, by the way, who evidently said no to a run uh, on his ticket, um, which suggests he's not planning to run, but if you're Ross Perot and you got 19% of the vote and then you run again, you get nine, you're a has-been. But if you get 19% and every four years you decide you might run, then you get on Larry King Live, you can do any editorial board meeting in the country you want to. For the rest of your life, you're the guy who might run for president again because you ran once. But I mean, remember what happens there. Ted Kennedy, my home state, Massachusetts, Ted Kennedy from 1968 was the guy who might run for president. Maybe Teddy will run. 
72, you've got this big problem with McGovern. Maybe Teddy will step in. 76, the you know, Democratic Party is going to nominate some unknown guy from Georgia. And, well, maybe Teddy will step in. Um, and then, and so every, he was always the guy invited to all the great parties, you know, because um, he might be president. He got free staff, people with PhDs and law degrees would come and work as interns in his office so they could put on their resume, worked as Kennedy staffer, because someday Kennedy would be president and they'd get to be like a, a local prosecutor, you know. Or, um, and so, and then he ran for president in 1980, in the primary against uh, Carter, got defeated, and never again did anyone say Ted Kennedy might be the Democratic nominee, might be president. It got so bad, he had to get married. I mean, you know, I mean, it, it just <laughs> ruined his social life. Um, and, you know, so if, if you're not sort of on the way up, you're on the way down. And, um, and, and so if I was Perot, if he runs again, he won't get 19%. He got 19% because George Bush said he wouldn't raise taxes and did, and a whole bunch of the Republican Party said, I can't vote for that. And Perot offered himself as a not terribly plausible candidate. But, yeah. Um, two things. I would argue that, that, that the Republicans are, because when you ask them where they are on the issues, they're 60 to 70 percent with us on everything from do you want higher taxes, do you want more spending, do you want more government, uh, do you want school choice, um, all of the kind of issues that, that divide the parties, they're with us. Now, they may not, in a, in a, in a uh, poll, tell you um, I'm going to vote for the Republicans necessarily because they haven't focused on it, and, and a lot of people don't have to. Um, I don't follow professional sports, so I see all the news about it, but it doesn't sink in. There are a lot of people who feel the same way about politics, or if you're, when I'm not buying a car, I don't read the car ads. I mean, I see them, they're in the magazines, they're on TV, but I couldn't tell you any that I've seen in the last three months because I haven't focused on them. And there are a lot of people who quite rationally, there's the old joke, if the election were held tomorrow, no one would show up because they were expecting it in November. Um, so if you have a poll and you ask people the question, who would you vote for tomorrow, that's not a meaningful question because nobody's planning on voting tomorrow. And so when you see Clinton's popularity preference go up and down, don't worry about that. The number to look for on the poll is re-elect number. Would you vote to re-elect? That has never for Clinton gone above 45. It's gone from 39 to 45, you know, around the 43 that he ran with. That's the key number for an incumbent. Do people think you should be reelected? And his numbers on that have never been good. But, you know, on a given day, do you like him? Do you think he's doing fine? Sure, why not? You know, he, get, he gave a speech. I saw him on TV, whatever. So don't watch the, that thing. Watch the core of, of whether anyone's willing to reelect him. Yeah. Two things. If a Republican, the numbers, I asked Gingrich, uh, what would it take for, for us, for the good guys, to be able to win in past legislation? He said 25 more Republicans in the House, 12 more in the Senate to get over both um, a, a filibuster and the fact that some Republicans on any given issue have to wander off, uh, and one president. Uh, I've also heard this rephrased by the Republican leadership as 2010-1. We need 20 more House members, 10 more senators, and one more president. Um, uh, if we get anything approaching that, something very much like Dick Armey's flat tax will pass in the first year. Um, it, it has been unfortunate that Dole and some others have criticized the flat tax because they are running against Forbes. But remember, it was Dole and Gingrich who put the Kemp Commission together, knowing that when you handed it to Kemp, he was going to come back with a flat tax. Um, so I, I think that Dole is much further along on, on that path than, than the campaign would. I mean, the, the one thing to remember, not about Dole, but about all the guys running in primaries, is that they say a lot of things that they're going to regret. It's like somebody at a party who has too much to drink, and the polite thing to do next week is to sort of ignore it and not mention what he said um, or try and think whether it had deep meaning. A lot of things <coughs> were, were said in that primary that when people sober up and get back together again as a party will just sort of drop down the memory hole. Uh, and I think the criticisms of the flat tax born of you know, you're, you're running for president, you, you pick up what you have and you throw it at the other guy, even if you 
you know, normally you might not have. Um, so I don't, I don't think that some of the harsh words against the flat tax are, are, are a sign of permanent disaffectation, and that's a word. But um, I do think that, that, that Dole is much more supportive of, of, of moving towards a flat tax, largely because, and his perceived hostility to the tax cut movement was based on having a Democratic House and the Democratic Senate, which kept spending money, and he thought, well, how can we cut taxes? Now we have a Republican House and Senate perfectly capable of cutting spending, and therefore tax cuts can work out. Can I take one more question, or? Okay, yeah. They haven't been able to do it well because their base generally won't let them. Um, in the House of Representatives, there is almost nobody standing who, f who qualifies as a conservative Democrat anymore. You have Stenholm, who always says he is, but I, I agree with Speaker Gingrich's observation that Stenholm is the most effective left-wing Democrat in Congress because he gets up and lies about what he's doing and then he does the left-wing thing. Um, he always folds to the left in, in Stenholm. Now, governors are a little more out front can't play some of the legislative games that people can. Um, but it's, it is extremely important to go to those people and get them to switch or beat them. Um, but we're going to live with a lot of Democrats governing as Republicans over the next 20 years as a, as a survival mechanism, just as we used to have a whole host of Republicans who governed as Democrats. I mean, Richard Nixon, EPA, OSHA, um, Legal Services, Corporation, wage and price controls, um, lending money to the Soviet Union. I mean, this, this was a guy who, if, if Richard Nixon were in Congress today as a Republican, he would be the most left-wing member of the House caucus for the Republican Party. There is nobody in the House of Representatives today on the de Republican side as liberal as Richard Nixon was. So when the Democrats were in the ascendancy, you had a whole bunch of Republicans governing as Democrats, and now you're going to see uh, a lot of Democrats trying to stay in office by governing in the direction of the Republican Party. Um, when they make a concession to you, take it and then beat them in the next election anyway. <laughs>